Hello everyone, this is Dr. Pruitt. Today we're going to be talking about pre-hospital management of the burn patient. Just to start off with, quick uh, quiz, give you a second to think about it, if you can figure out what the largest organ in the body is. It's actually the skin. And the skin, I think, doesn't get enough respect sometimes. We forget all the things that it provides for us until it gets broken. Five things, again, easy to remember, that the skin does is uh, protects us, obviously, from the environment, protects us from germs, which are out there in the environment, provides us with sensation, keeps us warm, and protects us from cold, obviously. And then it has a metabolic function as well in the fact that it helps us generate um, vitamin D for our bones to stay strong. So what happens when it's broken? Well, if you take those five things that the skin does and you think about what life would be like without it, we're very prone to infection when the skin is violated, very prone to hypovolemia. The skin keeps a lot of our moisture and interstitial fluids inside our body where they need to be, and when the skin is broken, we can get really prone to a lot of fluid loss. Helps keep us warm, so when the skin is violated, there is a higher risk for hypothermia. Malnutrition and also underlying tissue injury. If you think about the skin, the things just underneath the skin would be like tendons, bones, nerves, vasculature, and without the skin there to protect those things, they're very vulnerable to further injury. When you look at the skin, everyone knows there's three layers. There's the epidermis, that's the top. That's the layer that we see. The dermis is really where the majority of the skin does its work. This is the area that contains all the sweat glands, the oil glands, all the blood vessels that bring the nutrients and supply the blood flow, and then also does a lot of the metabolic work with the vitamin D synthesis as well. And then deeper to that, you have fatty tissue where you get a lot of the insulation and protection for the underlying tissues. When we think about burns, there's basically three different broad categories of burns. The first is thermal, and the standard one that people think about is fire. But this can also involve hot water or scalding fluids. Another type of burn is electrical, and then there's also chemical burns as well. And we'll go through all three of these types of burns today. So very important when you're thinking about thermal burns, the severity of these burns is going to directly correlate with how long that patient is exposed to the burning material. So temperature of the material and duration of the exposure are going to be huge, which means if you're trying to save a victim from a burn or remove someone from a burning situation, you want to take off the burning material as quickly as you can because that's going to decrease the severity of the underlying tissue damage. So thermal burns can be caused by anything from flames to scalding injury with hot water, contact with a hot surface, steam, or even flash burns. One of the most common ones I see in the pediatric emergency room is when a small child has pulled some ramen noodles out of the microwave and dumped the hot water all over their lap and their stomach. So just because we're talking about thermal burns doesn't necessarily mean it needs to be a flame. It can also be hot fluids. Now there are some patterns that we need to watch out for, especially as pre-hospital providers. When you see burn patterns like this, this is not normal. So um, unfortunately, one of the most common forms of child abuse is to submerse a child in hot water. So if you see circumferential burns of the feet or the lower body, or even cigarette burns on the hand, these are very common patterns that we need to work to identify in the pre-hospital setting to raise suspicion for child abuse and protect our most vulnerable patients. Now we all know that burns are graded by depth. There's first degree burns, second degree burns, and third degree burns. Second degree is uh, usually involving that dermis there, and that's divided into two subcategories, the superficial and the deep, and that just will indicate how much underlying tissue damage has occurred. When we look at a side view of what's going on in the skin, superficial or first degree burns basically just involves the epidermis. As you move towards second degree or partial thickness burns, blisters are going to start to develop. And then with full thickness burns, that goes down all the way into the, into the fatty tissues below the different layers. So superficial burns we've all had before. This is just your straightforward sunburn. Everyone knows what that feels like and what that looks like. As the burn gets a little bit deeper, you might start to see blisters. And some people can actually get this from sunburns as well. But this is where the heat intensifies and you're getting a little bit deeper into the skin. 
and full thickness goes all the way through to the fatty layer, sometimes down to bone or the underlying tissues. So with a first degree burn, these are typically very red, very painful, they're dry to the touch, and they typically heal on their own in three to five days. What we would do for these burns is simply pain control, and usually that's easily accomplished with just a cold compress or a wet towel. In the pre-hospital setting, it's not recommended to put any salves or ointments on these burns and no ice. Ice is going to cause vasoconstriction, and that's going to decrease the blood flow to the area and slow the healing. So cool compresses are fine, but no ice to the first degree burns. When we're talking about second degree, these are your partial thickness burns. These are the ones where you'll get, maybe, maybe not, get some blisters. They tend to be pink or red in color, and one of the easiest ways to distinguish them is that they appear wet. They're very moist. And when you're thinking about treatment for these burns, one of the questions that comes to mind is, do you pop the blisters? The answer is no. You let the blisters stay, because once you violate that protective skin covering, you're going to leave them more prone to infection. So the blisters will eventually pop on their own, but they don't need any help from pre-hospital providers. Big thing here is going to be pain control. These are typically very painful. It's basically exposed nerve endings in that subcutaneous tissue there and pain control is going to be big. And same thing here is with the first degree burns. Cool compresses, wet towels will help alleviate some of that pain and help them feel better. Importantly, we don't want to be putting any salves or ointments on these burns. And again, no ice. That's just going to impede healing. As we move on, again, getting a little bit deeper into the skin, the full thickness second degree burn, What's going to differentiate this from the partial thickness is that it appears dry. And these burns can either appear red or appear white. And it is a little bit deeper, so at this point it might not be as painful because those nerve endings might be damaged to the point where sensation is actually going to be diminished. We're also not going to have as much blanching because if you remember, this is the area of the skin where all the capillary beds are. And as those capillary beds are destroyed, there's not going to be, be as much blood flow to the area. So you might see diminished capillary refill or blanching. Usually these burns are deep enough to need excision and skin drafting and some surgical repair. For these burns for treatment in the pre-hospital setting, pain management is going to be huge. Again, you can use a cool, cool compress if uh, that helps the patient. At this point, you can also start to consider IV medications and IV fluids as well, depending on the severity of the burn. If needed, just to help again with pain control, you can cover with a clean, dry sheet. You're still not wanting to put any salves or ointments on the area and still no ice. Moving on to third degree burns, this is a burn that involves all layers of the skin and gets down to the tendons and the bones. These burns typically are not painful because the nerve endings are completely demolished. They can appear black or white, very leathery kind of skin and very dry. There's not going to be any blanching, which suggests that there's hardly any blood flow. And a lot of times in the areas where there's third degree burns, there's going to be no pain. But just remember that surrounding the area where there's third degree, there's likely second and first degree too. So the surrounding areas of the deeper burns are still going to be painful. When we talk about treatment for these burns, pain management is going to be a big piece of our considerations in the pre-hospital setting, which means you'll likely need IV access and to think about fluids depending on how large the burn surface is. Cover with a clean, dry sheet. That's going to help. We talked about how important skin is for preventing hypothermia, for keeping hypovolemia away, and also preventing infection. And that's easily helped with just a clean, dry sheet. Again, no salves or ointments on these burns and no ice. So I know we've all learned the rules of nines at one point, and it's hard to remember, and it's a whole lot of math. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't remind you of the rule of nines, but the way that I like to calculate body surface area involvement with burns is with the patient's palm. So if you take the actual patient's hand and measure from the, the base of the wrist to the tip of the finger, that's going to be 1%. And if you can just estimate using their palm the amount of body surface area involved, you'll get pretty close with your body surface area estimation. And I know we all learned a while ago the Parkland formula, again, a whole lot of math requiring a whole lot of fluids for burn resuscitation. But really, as more and more literature is coming out, what we're learning is we don't need to flood these patients with IV fluid, especially here in the city with our short transport times. 
what we need to do is definitely get IV access, but probably more for pain control than anything. And then we can start fluids going at about 500 milliliters an hour. There's no reason to flood them right out of the gate. And really, your patients that where hypovolemia is going to be a very big consideration are going to be the ones with major burns that involve more than 20% of their body surface area. UNM is the only burn center in the state, and patients that need to go to a burn center for specialized burn care would be patients that have greater than 20% body surface area involvement, any burns involving the airway or the face, any burns that are circumferential around an extremity or the torso, any burns involving the hands or the feet or the genitals, any third degree burn, and any electrical burn. So when we think about burns, inhalation and airway are always our number one concern in the pre-hospital setting. Airway burns can be caused by superheated gases, steam, toxic chemicals, anything that's going to irritate the lungs. And it's very important because the majority of fatalities and burns are related to airway emergencies. So you want to be aggressive in managing your airway and identify these early. Things you want to look for when you're considering airway warning signs would be obviously soot in the mouth. Every burn patient, you need to have them open their mouth, look back there if there's soot in there, if there's singed facial hair. Those are all indicators that they have a substantial possible burn to their posterior oropharynx and their lungs that are going to cause respiratory distress and impending airway collapse. You also want to listen to their voice. Is it hoarse? Are they coughing? Do they have strider? All of these are going to be clues that you need to act aggressively on that airway. Another thing you need to think about um, in your patients when you pull them out of a fire is their mental status. Burns by themselves should not have any effect on the patient's mental status. So if you have an altered patient that you've pulled out of a fire who's burned, you need to ask yourself why. And there's a couple of very important reasons to consider. One would be if it's a poisonous gas that they inhaled. Two is, is there concomitant trauma? Was there maybe a blast and they hit their head? And three is, are they hypoxic? Are they already having so much airway damage that the hypoxia is causing them to be confused and combative? So you need to troubleshoot your altered patient on a burn scene and figure out why, because burns themselves shouldn't cause an altered patient. So we did mention poisonous gases. I know you know this, but inside any structure fire, you need to consider what other things could possibly be inhaled. Carbon monoxide is one of the most important things to consider. It's uh, odorless, can't see it, can't hear it, and it's uh, basically difficult to identify. Your patient is going to have the carbon monoxide bind to their red blood cells and displace oxygen, so they're not getting oxygen delivery to the tissues. But the tricky thing is that their oxygen saturation will still be 100%. So basically, any patient that you pull out of a structure fire, you need to have a really high suspicion for carbon monoxide poisoning. And the easy piece from our perspective is the treatment for this is just high flow oxygen. So basically, any patient that gets pulled out of this situation needs oxygen immediately with the presumptive conclusion that they've been exposed to carbon monoxide. And another poisonous gas I know you know you should consider is cyanide poisoning. Anytime there's an enclosed structure fire, this is um, released by the burning of synthetic materials. And it basically suffocates cells to the point that, again, oxygen can't be delivered to the tissues to keep the brain and the heart and the lungs working like they should. And the way that we treat that is with a cyano kit. I would have that ready for any patient that's been involved in a structure fire. Moving on to the second kind of category of burns, electrical burns. Usually it's very important to look for an entrance and an exit wound. There's usually going to be both. And then you need to consider the path that the electrical current took between the entrance and the exit. If you can, while you're on scene, it's important to ask what type of current the patient was exposed to. Usually this has kind of a bimodal distribution. You'll see young children who put a plug in their mouth or stick their finger in a socket. And then there's your middle-aged adult people who tend to be working with electrical currents. And that's kind of, it's either going to be a young child or kind of a middle-aged male who's been working with currents. If it's your, your worker, they should know what kind of currents they're working with and be able to describe the voltage for you. Children might not be as able to do that, but usually it's just simple household appliances for them. 
Now, you do need to consider cardiac arrhythmias in these patients. It's important to get a 12 lead. If you approach the scene of a patient who's unconscious and unresponsive and there is concern for an electrical injury, early defibrillation will be very important. Now, the thing about these burns is in and of themselves, when you look at, for instance, that guy's finger, it doesn't look that bad. But what is important to consider is all the underlying tissue damage that has occurred that you can't see. So this is where IV fluids will be important. Pain control will be very important. And typically, these patients will be admitted to the hospital for several days because they really evolve over time and can become very bad. The third category of burns is chemical burns. Basically, this is easy. If it's a dry chemical, you just want to brush it off, get it off the skin, decontaminate your patient. If it's a, a liquid kind of burn exposure, you want to just irrigate and irrigate and irrigate as much as you can. If the burns involve the eye, again, irrigation is going to be the key. You can see here in the picture on the right how you can hook up a bag of normal saline and just drip into the patient's eye. Pain control will be big here too, so don't, don't hesitate to give some peripheral medications if you need to. But most importantly is going to be getting that chemical out of the eye as quickly as you can. Now, poison control is always very helpful in these situations. It, again, like with any exposure, you want to identify the chemical as quickly as you can if you have that capability on scene, and then call poison control, and they might have some more uh, helpful hints or tips for you on your patient management. Number one thing on any burn scene, I know you know this, but you always want to be safe. Don't want to make two patients. When you're doing your primary survey, same as always, you're going to do your ABCs. Again, airway is going to be huge in your burn patients and your inhalation patients. But it's also important to consider trauma. A lot of times, trauma can be hidden when these patients, these scenes are kind of chaotic. If there was a blast involved or some sort of jumping or getting thrown or maybe a car fire, always consider underlying trauma too, so be very thorough in your patient assessment. In your secondary assessment, always, you know, vital signs are vital. They're there for a reason. And as you're talking to your patient, you want to estimate your body surface area. Again, I would recommend that 1% Palmer method. Try to figure out the depth, treat their pain, and remove any clothing or any debris that might cause constriction or further burning. Some things that you can do for them, again, pain control is going to be huge, keeping them warm. Use that clean sheet, no salves or ointments. And then if, if it's a fairly superficial burn, you can use a cool compress as well. Think about fluids, consider those, but use them judiciously. Remember not to flood your patient and continually reassess, especially with that airway. It's important to note that burns evolve over time, so you really need to pay attention, especially if you have a circumferential burn to an extremity. Make sure you're monitoring distal pulses and watching for compartment syndrome. Sometimes when the skin, especially with circumferential burns, as the skin starts to swell and that burn evolves over time, it can swell to the point that it cuts off distal circulation. So the p patient might be experiencing worsening pain. You might see the extremity getting pale. It might be cool to the touch. They'll start to complain of nerve pain might get to the point where they can't move it and ultimately you'll lose a pulse. These are all the six P's of compartment syndrome, things to watch out for that might indicate that the patient will need a fasciotomy at the hospital. There's not much you can do about it in the pre-hospital setting other than identify it and recognize the need to emergently transport and get that taken care of in order to save the limb. The most vulnerable patients when we're talking about burn populations are children less than two any elderly patient, patients with underlying lung disease, or complicated medical history. These are the ones who aren't just going to be able to bounce back right away from burns and need to be treated a little more seriously because they don't have as much underlying reserve. And that is all I have. If you have any questions, please contact your 7-8. Thank you.